to what's making news in China. And trending on Chinese social media, there was much debate about the US government considering a ban on TikTok. Lawmakers have cited national security concerns about the Chinese-owned app, saying it can spy on American citizens and have already banned it from being downloaded on government-issued devices. We have expressed concerns over China's uh, potential use of software platforms that could endanger or threaten uh, America's safety and their national security. So that is the president's concern. That is why uh, we have uh, called on Congress to take action. We all know there's only one way to resolve this. A TikTok dance-off. No? Not cool? Way too old for that? Fine. There are reports the Biden administration is demanding TikTok be sold to an American company if it wants to continue to operate there. Last week, TikTok CEO Shouzi Chu, who was from Singapore, fronted Congress and the bipartisan push against the app. We're committed to be very transparent with our users about what we collect. I don't think what we collect, I don't believe what we collect is more than you most see, players in the industry. My problem here is you're trying to give the impression that you're going to move away from Beijing and the Communist Party. You're trying to give the impression that you're a good actor. But the commitments that we would seek uh, to achieve those goals are not being made today. His appearance got people talking over on Weibo and the Chinese version of TikTok, Douyin. They don't want to give Shou Zichu the time to respond and perhaps they don't even want to hear the answers. The US seeks to supervise and control the whole world. If it cannot control something, it feels like it is going to be finished. This isn't that different from foreign sites being banned in China. Also getting people excited, Shou Zichu himself. A truly seasoned debater, elegant and graceful, he charmed me to my very core. Becoming a fan of Zhou Shouzi, the pinnacle of working people, calm, wise and restrained. This man is so hot, isn't he? Yeah, as global citizens, we have to fight with all the strength in our juicy biceps. And we demand the right to live our lives without being watched by those big brown eyes and a face with incredible bone structure. Sorry, what were we talking about again? The other topic making a splash on socials this week, the once prominent, now much more low-key businessman, Jack Ma. Returning to China after more than a year overseas, the founder of Alibaba visited a school in Hangzhou, taking time to discuss the future of education in the age of artificial intelligence. Once the richest man in China, Jack Ma disappeared from public view after he gave a speech in 2020 that criticised the regulation of China's financial system. The hashtag Jack Ma back in China has over 470 million views on Weibo. Although personally, I would have named the hashtag Jack Ma 2, Jack with a vengeance. Jack Ma is a symbol. He is a symbol of the internet economy and a symbol of China's private economy. What is behind this mass exodus of wealthy people? Jack Ma went abroad and then returned to the country. No one explained why, but everyone understood the message being conveyed. Joining us now is reporter Wenli Ma. Wenli, is Jack Ma your uncle? Sadly, no, he is not. <laughs> I see. Interesting. <clears throat> so you've done some stories about celebrities getting cancelled in China, and this is another example of that. What happened to Jack Ma after he gave that speech? Yeah, Jack Ma gave that speech, and then uh, a few days later, Alibaba's $255 billion IPO was cancelled, and he basically disappeared from public view for about two or three years. You know, he was somebody who was quite outspoken, had a very high profile, and all of a sudden, crickets. Nothing. Yeah, this is a huge, I mean, his reappearance. So what is the message uh, being conveyed here with his um, reappearance? That China is open for business, that uh, they're supporting private enterprise, they're supporting entrepreneurs, that they are, you know, backing people who've made a lot of money. There's been quite a bit of economic malaise over the past few years because of the COVID zero policies, and this is a way for them to sort of kind of kickstart the economy again. So it's a very clear message. We want your ideas. We want you to make heaps and heaps of money. And Jack Maher is someone who is seen as a bit of a bellwether figure for that industry. So 
for him to kind of get permission to pop, pop his head back up and go, hey, I'm here, don't forget about me, is a very clear signal to business people in China, but also internationally, that the regime is changing a little bit. They're pivoting. It's definitely something we'll keep a close eye on. While I have you here, though, I want to ask you about something I saw trending on Weibo. It is a novel called The Bodyguard and the School Beauty. What's up with that? Well, A, that's a great title, uh, but it's a serialised web fiction. It's been going since 2011. It's just it's a story that's on the internet. It's updated every day. There's a, there are millions and millions of fans who have been reading it, devouring it, but they're getting a little impatient. They kind of think after 12 years there should be a bit of a resolution a bit of an ending. They've obviously never seen The Bold and the Beautiful or Home and Away, uh, but uh, yeah, they, they, want a, they want an ending. I think this was the first novel I've ever read. How is it not finished yet? Trust me, just skip to the latest chapter and you can still catch up. I'm the type of person who reads a book and goes straight to the back page. I love to spoil it for myself. This is not something I can do in this case. No, you'd be stuffed in this case. But it is a storytelling trend that is quite unique to China and uh, it's something I decide to have a look at. There's nothing like curling up on the couch with a good book, getting lost in a swashbuckling fantasy or a swooning romance. But in China, the most popular stories aren't being sold in bookstores. They don't even need a publisher. They're being read online. Web fiction is big business in China right now. So big, it was a hot topic at the recent political meetings of Congress, the two sessions. Yang Jingming is the vice chairman of the China's Writers Association and used his time in front of China's political elite to call for more to be done to protect authors who haven't gone down the more traditional publishing path. While in the Western world, web fiction might conjure the idea of a few enthusiastic writers bashing out fan fiction for friends about their favourite TV or movie characters, in China it's an entire industry, worth 28 billion renminbi according to the China Project. Ying Shen is a popular writer who uploads stories focused on suspense and romance. Her work has included Warm Sky, Dream of a Wealthy Family 3, The Yearning That Never Ages, and Never Been in Love, Already Deeply in Love. The former journalist has been writing web fiction for more than a decade and does it full time. Her fans have even set up group chats obsessing over her stories. There are 20 million web fiction writers scribing for 502 million readers. That is 20 times Australia's entire population, all sitting on their devices and devouring stories which can stretch out to millions of words. Definitely a, a, a democratization of literature. And uh, I would like to argue that it's one of the largest uh, mass uh, literary writing and a reading movement in human history. And Chinese web fiction is uploaded at a really fast pace. In fact, some of the most popular writers produce 10,000 words every day. But in China, they, they invented uh, this like a literary version of Spotify or YouTube or Netflix. So as a reader, you pay a subscription fee. And with this payment, you have uh, access to your favorite novels, which will be updated at least once a day. One web fiction company, China Literature, released 1.2 million titles in 2021. No publishing house in the world can come close to that kind of output. And China's history and culture is uniquely placed to have enabled this development to thrive. Okay, so it's a convergence of multiple factors 
So you can attribute the rise of this phenomena to the rise of uh, well, the arrival of the internet. Well, of course, we definitely need that. And we also need mass literacy, which was provided by the state. And then we, 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 we need the absence of a, uh, an old publication system, which was absent, again, thanks to the state. So the state played a very significant role. And there are many genres available. If rom-coms with a supernatural twist are your jam, you can find them online. If family melodramas are more your style, you can also find them online. Or maybe you want to follow the travels of a grave digger who's plagued by spirits, which is the plotline of Ghost Blows Out the Light, a popular series from 2007 which was made into an eight-volume series of paper novels, a game, two movies, and three TV series. Ying Shun's work has also been adapted for the screen. She says recent years have seen more formal structures put in place to support the work that's been created and the money at stake. 然后可以做出版,可以做漫画,可以做周边等等的这种,还有广播剧啊之类的。其实是一套很完整的一个流程了的。那我有的朋友他的网络价值是上亿的。嗯,他的从这种版权这种这种呃影视上面,然后呢,
is a bit of his legacy in trying to preserve peace or a lack of animosity, a lack of hostility between China and Taiwan, given the tensions have risen considerably under President Tsai's time in office. However, I would say that in Taiwan and around the world, really, the focus is not really on Ma's visit, but on President Tsai's visit to the Americas. That is also what Beijing is focused on, and they are extremely unhappy with her stopovers in uh, New York and in California, um, kind of bookending this trip she's making to Central America to shore up alliances. Because as we know, you know, Beijing over Tsai's um, tenure in office, she came into office in 2016, Beijing has steadily won over some of the former diplomatic allies of Taiwan. And now the island only has 13. Honduras just last week switched loyalties because of the economic appeal of China. Now, the next presidential election in Taiwan is less than a year away. What do these visits, one to China and one to North America, tell us about the political divide on the island? I think they speak to the real range of political opinion on this idea of the situation with China. President Tsai says that Taiwan is a sovereign state. China says it's a breakaway province that will eventually one day be reunited with the mainland. The KMT, the opposition, which actually historically had always led Taiwan, they've never said exactly that they are pro-reunification or unification with China, but rather they are pro-peace. I think, though, when you speak to Taiwanese people, and from my reporting, we're speaking with with locals most people just want to preserve the status quo so you speak of this election coming up obviously that's led to a lot of tensions um, in Taiwan but when you speak to locals they kind of say how they've grown up with this history of tension so it's always almost kind of normal to them one thing we could look to for where the political wind is blowing were last year's local elections so they happened in November 2022 and while these are elections on the local level they did show a extreme swing away from the DPP i.e the ruling party and that actually led to President Tsai resigning as head of that party because the DPP lost so badly. As China continues to try and reinvigorate its economy in the aftermath of COVID lockdowns, the government says it wants to welcome foreign investors. Premier Li Chang met a group of foreign business executives in Beijing this week, including Apple's Tim Cook. Praising their contribution to China's economy, he reportedly reassured them that the country will open up further. Lengthy and draconian lockdowns saw an exodus of foreign companies and talent during COVID. Meanwhile, Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews has visited China to promote trade and international study. And Premier of Western Australia, Mac McGowan, has announced a plan to visit China to talk tourism. Francis, what does this tell us about China's current economic position? It's quite clear, um, you know, that China is really seeking to bring back a lot of that foreign investment, which um, was blocked or, or left during the three years of its zero COVID policy where borders are closed. Recently, we saw uh, visas for foreign nationals uh, being open again for so people can now go back into China and for business people, travel is much more easier too. This week, we've seen a lot of high profile visits, both from Australian leaders, but on the global global stage, there was particular attention paid to um, the Apple CEO, Tim Cook's visit. And it's all kind of leading to building business confidence in China again. This push for business engagement comes after a lot of, quite frankly, very bad press, right, particularly from the US. We're seeing a lot of talk in the Western media about the dangers of Chinese companies. So if we just look at, you know, the news agenda last week, that was dominated by the US Congress hearing of TikTok, which is owned by a Chinese company ByteDance. And so in the public rhetoric, there's all this chat about, um, you know, how dangerous, you know, China's businesses pose as a national security threat, um, and it's dangerous to operate in China. At the same time, we're also seeing the past six months the US really cracked down on chip technology and sending that really necessary advanced semiconductor technology to China. Uh, The US has really linked essentially restricting parts of China's economy and really kind of big industries. And they've linked that to national security and geopolitical concerns. Francis Mao, thank you for joining China tonight. Thank you. 
While the government might be looking overseas to attract international investment and talent, on a more local level, cities within China are competing too, with each other. Traditionally, it hasn't been easy for Chinese citizens to migrate between cities and provinces. Samuel Yang explains why. Lingling grew up in Shanghai, but always felt like an outsider in the city. She was actually born in a rural village in Henan province, which her family left behind when she was only two. 听不懂当地的方言，没有办法跟当地人交流，又是他们口中的大城市来的孩子，那么当时的我就在困扰我的问题就是，那我到底是属于哪里的人？对，是。Because of where she was born, Lane didn't have access to the same educational resources that her urban-born peers enjoyed. It's all thanks to a controversial, long-standing policy, the hukou system. The policy was established in the 1950s to track and control movement, as the government didn't want big cities to be overpopulated. Hukou is almost functioning as if it is a passport, which allows you from one part of the country to move to the another part of the country. And in order to settle down as a permanent resident and being treated as local citizens, you have to have the passport or hukou registration. It was also designed as a tool to better help central planners allocate resources. If you are not a local citizen, you cannot have access to good quality public school for your uh, children. Your child cannot take national exam. You cannot have access to social housing. It is difficult for you to get full pension coverage as well. I think Hukou policy in a nutshell is discriminatory and it's inefficient. Until recently, rural Hukou holders weren't even allowed to move freely outside their hometowns. It was only in 2003 that the Chinese government abolished the policy that allowed local authorities to arrest and evict migrant workers in the cities. But many rural families, like Lin's, still choose to relocate to cities for better opportunities, even though they aren't entitled to the same benefits as their peers. <laughs> 我们来上海二十多年林 eventually decided to give up on her high school education so she could stay with her family in Shanghai. But more and more young people are now being sent back to their rural towns, far away from their parents, in order to finish their studies. Xiao Yan Kong was born in a rural area in Anhui. Her family moved to Shanghai when she was one month old. 就我在初二的时候, 在跟父母一起生活了14 it's estimated that there are about 170 million students affected by these policies. 
I would say that the population that pays the largest social price, the brunt, right, of migration is definitely young people. First, they may not have decided, and I doubt that they actually influence their family's decision to migrate. Parents migrate for a better life for their children, but that's different from children saying, I want us to move or I do not want us to move. The hookah system has been loosened in recent years, allowing movement to smaller cities to fill job vacancies. But this isn't the case for larger cities. Experts say reform has been painfully slow. There have been a lot of efforts trying to change the system, but it's always difficult. What the main problem now is that the social welfare entitlement are attached to hukou. The reform that needs to be done is to detach them so allow resources to be allocated according to where people are rather than where people from. I think the difficulties now is the Chinese elite have obviously their interests, right? When you think about uh, who would not want hukou reform, the obvious answer would be those who have privileged hukous right now. Are they willing to share their social resources with people that, that don't have that Shanghai hukou or Beijing hukou? I think this is a, a moment for not just the government to set policies that set a moral tone, but for citizens of China to really consider what is a commitment to equality. Hi. Back in Shanghai, oh. Ling is now married oh. to a local resident, which means she can apply for a Shanghai hukou. But she says it's no longer a priority. Uh, I'm 29 so I'm Sam, thank you for putting together such an emotional story there. I have heard, though, that the city of Hangzhou is going to be relaxing their hukou rules. Yeah, Hangzhou is an affluent city in China's east, and it's got a population of about, of about 12 million people. Um, it's a half size of uh, Shanghai's, but it's still very, very big. So the local government proposed a bill to encourage more people to be localised to apply for local hukou. And uh, if you're un under the age of 35 and you've got a diploma and you can apply, which is essentially lower the criteria for the um, educational qualification. Um, so the local government is currently consulting with the local communities and uh, it's likely the bill is going to go ahead. Mm. And it's only one of the string of cities that's going to be considering loosening some of those rules. Yeah, that's right. Many Chinese cities, including Guangzhou and Shanghai, have relaxed their rules to entice university graduates by offering local hukou. And um, especially Right now, it's, uh, the Chinese cities are in hot competition for young talent to, so in order to maintain the population growth because China has an ageing um, issue. And uh, last year, the city of Zhengzhou in China's central east lifted the hukou restric restrictions altogether. Wow, that sounds quite promising for the next generation. Thanks, Sam. Thank you.